All right. Any of you guys reading Matthew 24? <laughs> All right. Last week I suggested to you to read Matthew 24 as a way to keep ahead and to be ahead and to understand what it is that we're fixing to go over. Yeah. For the next few weeks, Matthew 24 is going to be the central focus of everything that we talk about. Yeah. So again, I urge you, I compel you to read Matthew chapter 24. Yes. Okay. It's the signs of our King's return. You know, as disciples of Christ, man, as those who love God, one of the duties that we're called to be is a watchman. You know what that is? A watchman. Have you guys ever had a, a buzzman? You know, the guy that watched out for you while you did your thing? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what a watchman is. Only difference is that instead of watching out for the police or for the cops or the guards, yeah, now we're watching for these things that Christ is telling us in Matthew 24. Yes. And there's a reason we're watching out. Because we got a job to do as watchmen. And that's to tell other people. And that's what I'm doing here today. Yes. yes. Telling other people. Opening the eyes of other people to show them the nearness of our King and His return. Yes. Obviously, we can't put dates on it. But when you look at these sounds that we're going to go over, and you see the increase and the frequency and the intensity, you understand that the time is at hand. Yes. That this generation is, in fact, the last generation that Christ speaks of that shall see his return. I don't know how many of you guys have. Ever thought about the rapture? Ever watched a movie about the rapture? Ever heard a book about the rapture? Or ever heard anybody else ever talk about the rapture? But what I'm going to hear, what I'm here today to tell you about this event is that every single person in this world is going to see Jesus Christ returning in the clouds. Everyone. Everyone. Yes. And this will be that moment. This will be that moment when those who refuse to love Him will run. Will run. Caves and to the dens, yes. asking the rocks to call upon them and hide them, the face of him who sits on the throne. This will be the day when there will be no more doubt as to the validity of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, yes, yes. This is also be the reason why anyone who takes the mark of the beast from there on out will not be forgiven because they seen and didn't believe. Huh? That's why. That's exactly why. So, let's start with Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3. This is going to be the signs of the past, yes. What I'm going to show you today is prophecies that have been written thousands of years ago and have been fulfilled. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? That's all we're going to write in Matthew 24 today. This building that they were talking about, these buildings, this complex, huge, it was the temple of God, God's house of prayer. Everything that happened in Jerusalem happened in this place. Everything, all government, all religion, all judgment, all everything happened in this building. This building was the central focus of an entire nation. It was huge. It was glorious. Covered in gold and ivory. Yes. Stones that weighed tons and tons and tons. It was massive. And Jesus told his disciples, that there was not one stone that was stacked upon another that would not be thrown down. And they had no idea what he was talking about. Nobody that heard this had any understanding what Jesus was talking about. Because to them, this building was the cornerstone of their faith. Yes. 
guess what happened? In 70 AD, the Romans invaded from what at that time was called Byzantium, which today is Turkey. Yes, a huge, huge force of Romans invaded Jerusalem. And guess what they did? They burnt that temple. Burnt it. All that gold that was covering everything inside of this building melted down in between these stones. The Romans was greedy. Yeah, the Romans were greedy. Guess what they did? They tore that building down, stone by stone, collected that gold that had run down until they got to the foundation. And they couldn't move it. They couldn't move the foundation. And it still sits in Jerusalem today. It's called the Temple Mount. They couldn't move those blocks. Yes. And the masses. Massive stones, some weighing as much as a hundred tons. They couldn't move. Yes. Immovable. Brothers, this prophecy has been fulfilled. These are words that have been written to you. Words that were spoken of our king that have come to pass. We don't think about it. Don't even care about it. No worry. Is this prophecy that has come to pass? There are so many more words. Each week I come down here and I tell you promise after promise after promise after promise that God is making to us. And we take no heed to it, no care for it. I don't even see it. This whole entire this whole, this, brothers, all of creation, all of time that has passed has been about one nation. One nation of people. These are lots. These are God's chosen people. These were the people that God chose, first off, to reveal himself to. Out of all the nations in the earth, chose the Hebrews. Yes. They were supposed to be a light unto the rest of the world of God's goodness, of God's holiness, of God's law, of God's power, of God's goodness, of God's grace, of everything about God. They were supposed to be the light of it unto the rest of the world. But God had a greater plan than that. Yes. Because God is now adopted. Anyone who believes on the name of Jesus Christ into this nation of his people. Yes. I read those scriptures from Peter. Yes. Who were once not a people of God, but who are now a people of God. Who have not received mercy, but now have received mercy. Who walked in darkness, but is now in this marvelous light. You. You. Each and every one of you sitting here today. Brothers, I don't care what you think. I don't care how you feel. I don't care how much Bible you know. I don't care how much you think you love Jesus or don't love Jesus. I'm telling you now, that God has brought you here today. And you got a job. You got a job. Listen. This is all that is. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon that people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. That's what it's all about. Ending sin. God made this world, sin came into this world, and sin was the judge. And when it's judged, there shall be no more. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. It's the city of Jerusalem coming down from the sky. That's when God dwells among men. That's a day that we can hope for. To be in the presence of our Creator. Know thereof and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks, sixty-nine weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. 
And after three score and two weeks, Sal Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. We'll stop right there. God sent prophets into the children of Israel. Isaiah, Ezekiel, yes, Jeremiah. These men that came to warn the nation of Israel of impending destruction. The Babylonian captivity. Any of you guys heard that? The Babylonian captivity for the Judeans. The Assyrian captivity for the Israelites. Yes. But they wouldn't listen. Yeah, they wouldn't listen. And so God brought it to pass. Yes. This is what he's talking about. After this captivity. After this destruction. The temple's been rebuilt twice. Twice. And it's fixing to be rebuilt a third time. For those of you who are keeping up with what's going on in the Holy Land, yes? Uh, don't worry, we're going to go over it. This is what Daniel's telling us. Listen again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be 69 weeks. Brothers, these weeks are prophetic weeks. Each day in this week is one year. 69 times 7 is 483 years. Now, I don't know how many of y'all had any history lessons or know or understand. But the Babylonians came and conquered the Israelites and enslaved them. And for 70 years, they lived in Babylon as slaves and captives. But the Persians rose up and conquered the Babylonians. Yes. And Cyrus the Great released the Hebrew people from Babylon and sent them back home. And the next king after him, Artaxerxes, gave the commandment to restore the city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah went out and built this wall in troublous times. Yes. Nehemiah 18. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I want you to think about that. All the nations surrounding these few people who were going out to build this city were being attacked day in and day out. And they were strong enough to build this wall, to build this city, despite all circumstances. Why? Because they were happy. They were joyful to be free, to no longer be slaves, to be building this kingdom for themselves. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Brothers, you got a job to do. You got a kingdom to build. Stone by stone. Each and every person you meet is a lively stone that's going to be used to build up this kingdom that we're going to inhabit. And as you build this kingdom, even in troublous times, you will have the joy of the Lord. And that joy will be your strength. That joy will enable you to endure any persecution, any circumstance, and any situation, whether it be homelessness, whether it be hunger, whether it be thirst, whether it be depression, whether it be loneliness, whatever it is. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Remember this. This prophecy, 69 weeks, it was exactly 483 years from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem that Jesus Christ hung on the cross to the day. No other person but God can know that. No other person but God could write a prophecy so detailed down to the day. Brothers, there's many, many, many false religions out there. Many, many books of prophecies out there. And none of them have come into pass. Not with the specifics that God writes. The one who knows all things. The one who sees all things. The one who has called you and ordained you and equipped you. None. None need to remember that.
70 weeks were determined upon this people, talking about the Hebrew people. From the going forth of the commandment to restore the wall until Messiah the Prince shall be cut off was 483 years, 69 weeks. But it said 70 weeks was determined upon that people. There's still a week left. These 70 weeks stopped the moment that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army. Some people call this the church age. Some scholars call it the age of grace. These, these 70 weeks were put on pause so that the men and women like us could enter into this kingdom. So that men and women like us could believe on the name of Jesus Christ and be adopted into this holy covenant. What are you waiting for? You ain't got forever. It's almost done. Oh, I guess you're going to start waiting for asteroids to fall from the sky. You're going to wait on the waters to turn to blood before you get on your knees and call out to Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, you're not promised tomorrow. How many have you known? How many have you known that have fell out around you thinking that they were got tomorrow? How many of you should be here? Don't worry, guys. Don't worry. This last week, he said, and he shall confirm the covenant with me for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined should be poured out upon the desolate. Brothers, that's the description of this last week. Christians, we call it the tribulation period. That's what we call it. It's seven years. One year for each day of this last week. In reality, it's called... Jacob's trouble because this tribulation that's coming upon the world is coming upon the Hebrew people as some of you might understand us that love Christ we're going to be taken down in the world it's called the rapture yeah. All right. this trouble is time this great tribulation this wrath of God has got nothing to do with us except you got a job you got a job. And I can't get into that today, boys. I can't get into that today. This is about the past. Just know that in the midst of this week, this man, remember this prince is, has caused the daily sacrifice to cease. Yes, the Jews are going to rebuild the temple. And they're going to start sacrificing animals again. They're going to start keeping the, the works of the law again. Yes, it's happening now. They're already making sacrifices for those of you who not know this. And if you don't, you do now. They're already making sacrifices. They're already starting to keep the holy festivals again. Yes, they are gearing up to begin Judaism once again. Daniel 12, 1 through 4. Listen. And at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince would stand for the children of that people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This is still happening, but it's also in the past. This increase of knowledge, brothers, huh? this increase of knowledge that we had is a computer. 
knowledge doubles every six months now. And they're talking like it's going to start doubling every three months with the advent of 5G technology. For those of you who may have heard of that, yeah. the next generation of cellular phone service. Yeah, all right. Knowledge used to take hundreds of years to double. The amount of knowledge, what would be contained in books, yes. Now it's contained in the cloud. Now it's contained on the internet. Now it's contained on hard drives and servers all across the world. The amount of information, which is what knowledge is. Yes, knowledge is data. Yes, all right. It doubles every six months. And it's only getting faster. Knowledge shall be increased. How about running to and fro? Do you know that you can travel around the world in hours? Think about that. You can hop on a jet and travel all the way around the world in a matter of hours. What used to take a lifetime can now be accomplished in a matter of hours. How does that process go to you? This Zechariah 7. 8 through 14. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hear and pulled away and stopped up their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts have sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I will not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them. No man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. God came to the children of Israel. He came to them by prophets. And I told you their names earlier. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. And there were many lesser prophets. Habakkuk. Zechariah, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Malachi, Micah. Many, many prophets that God sent to these people. That they slew. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They didn't want to hear the law. They didn't want to obey God. And so God, after the death of his son, scattered the Hebrew people all across the world. When the Romans came and conquered the city, they enslaved the entire nation of Israel and scattered them all over the Roman Empire. And ever since then, they've been wandering from nation to nation, from persecution to persecution, from inquisition to inquisition, all the way up to the Holocaust. Yeah, that's real. That happened. Six million Jews. Yeah. And I know these things that happened to them were choices that were made by me. But as you just heard, it was something that God had planned for them because they refused to listen. Because they refused to hear. Because they refused to obey Him. Now, Lots of people think it's because they killed Jesus. But Jesus said the sins against the Son of Man shall be forgiven them. Yes. The only unforgivable sin is sin against the Holy Ghost. All right. God scattered them because they would not listen. God afflicted them because they would not hear. Because they stopped up their ears. You know. Much like some of these places out here in this world today it does, don't they? It is. They don't want to hear the law. They want to be free from the law. They don't want to have to keep the commandments of God. Jesus kept the commandments of God. We're free. It is. 
guys gonna do the same thing with you, Bruce. Chris, no doubt. Make no mistake. But listen. Listen, we laid the pleasant land desolate. <clears throat> when the Jews were cast out of Israel, the land was laid desolate. It had only ever produced, or it had only ever been fruitful because of God's blessing upon it. And once they cast out the children of Israel, God cursed the land that it would no more be a pleasant, fruitful land. Anybody ever heard of Mark Twain? Yeah? In 1867, Mark Twain took a trip to Israel, or what was called Palestine at that time. And he wrote a book about it. It was called The Innocence Abroad. This is chapter 56. We'll read just a little bit here. And let's see if his description of the land of Israel lines up with what God prophesied. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Where Sodom and Gomorrah reared their domes and towers, the solemn sea now floods the plain, in whose bitter water no living thing exists, over whose waveless surface the blistering air hangs motionless and dead, about whose borders nothing grows but weeds and scattering tufts of cane, and that treacherous fruit that promises refreshment to parching lips but turns to ashes at the touch. Nazareth is forlorn about that fort of Jordan where the host of Israel entered the promised land with songs of rejoicing. One finds only a squalid camp of fantastic Bedouins of the desert. Jericho, the accursed, lies a moldering ruin. Today, even as Joshua's miracle left it more than 3,000 years ago, Bethlehem and Bethany and their poverty and their humiliation having nothing about them now to remind them that once new honor of the Savior's presence. The hallowed spot where the shepherds watched their flocks by night and where the angels sang peace on earth, goodwill to men is unlivable by any living creature and unblessed by any feature that is pleasant to the eye. Renowned Jerusalem itself the stateliest name in history has lost all its ancient grandeur and has become a pauper's village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the glory of Israel. Excuse me. The admiration of visiting Oriental queens. The wonderful temple which was the pride and glory of Israel is gone. And the Ottoman crescent is lifted above the spot where on that most memorable day in the annals of the world they reared the Holy Cross. The noted Sea of Galilee where Roman fleets once rung the anchor and the disciples of the Savior sailed in their ships was long ago deserted by the devotees of war and commerce and its borders are silent wilderness. Capernaum is a shapeless ruin. Magdala is the home of beggared Arabs. Bethsaida and Chorazin have vanished from the earth and the desert places round about them where thousands of men once listened to the Savior's voice and ate miraculous bread sleep in the hush of solitude that is inhabited only by birds of prey and skulking foxes. The land of Israel was like this, brothers and sisters. God laid waste to it. That nothing would grow. That there would be no fruit there. And that's exactly what happened. I believe Mark Twain's eyewitness account of what Israel looked like in 1867. Hundreds, thousands of years this land was laid a desolate ruin. Until recently. Until recently. Let's find out a little about that. I'm going to have to go to my Bible for that. Ezekiel 36. Listen. 
prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel and say unto the mountains and to the hills to the rivers and to the valleys thus saith the Lord God behold I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury because he hath borne the shame of the heathen therefore thus saith the Lord God I have lifted up mine hand surely the heathen that are about you they shall bear their shame but ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the wastes shall be built up. And I will multiply upon you men and beasts, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee. And thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. Thus saith the Lord God, because they say unto you, Thy land devourest up men, and has bereaved thy nations. Therefore, thou shalt devour men no more, neither bereave thy nations any more, saith the Lord God. Neither will I cause men to hear in thee the shame of the heathen any more. Neither shalt thou bear the reproach of the people any more. Neither shalt thou cause thy nations to fall any more, saith the Lord God. I don't know how many of you guys don't know this and understand this. But Israel, right now, has one of the most fruitful pieces of real estate in this world. One of the most fruitful pieces of real estate in this world. Israel is the number one exporter of fruits and vegetables to Europe in the world this tiny tiny piece of land just a little larger than Rhode Island as the number one exporter of fruits and vegetables to Europe in this world that's called fruit that's called fruit Europe is a huge place yes because God prophesied to Ezekiel and then he brought it to pass this is something that's happened in recent history something that we can look back and see that it was not there but now it is that the word of God said it would be desolate and it was and then he said it would produce much fruit and it does promises promises are promises brothers and sisters promises that you can take to the bank things that are happening before our very eyes look here Ezekiel 37 Ezekiel 36 was the restoration of the land of Israel. Ezekiel 37 is the restoration of the people of Israel. I want you to listen to this description. Ezekiel 37 verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sat me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley, and though they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, the shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and flesh came up upon them. And the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. And then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus say the Lord God, Behold, all my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, which have opened your graves. All my people have brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Bones. Anybody seen any pictures of the Holocaust? Anybody ever seen pictures of the mountains of bones out behind our furnaces? Dry bones. God restored his people in 1948. He caused them to become a living nation again. The only peoples from antiquities to become a nation again. No other nation from antiquity has ever come back before modern man. None. Not the Greeks, not the Romans, not the Spartans, not the Egyptians, none of them, but the Hebrews. With the same language, the same customs, the same religion, no other nation in history has ever been resurrected like this. God prophesied. God prophesied. And then he brought it to pass. Something that we've all seen. Something that we all know. Something that cannot be denied. Can't be denied, brothers and sisters. The whole word of God is truth. Every single written word is true and cannot be denied. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't. And that's what you must take hope in each and every day, brothers. Each and every day. If it hasn't happened to you yet, it doesn't mean that it won't. If it hasn't happened for you yet, it doesn't mean that it won't. Keep holding on. Keep doing what God is telling you to do. Keep loving Jesus Christ with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your spirit. And it will come to you. It will fill you with power, and peace, and patience. God's Holy Spirit will fill you. And you will go forth. He's raised you up. Each and every one of you, He has raised up in this world to work for Him. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I've told you over and over and over. I've read scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture telling you. Do you believe it? God's word is true, brothers and sisters. God restored the people of Israel. This is Isaiah 66, 5 to 13. Hear the word of the Lord. You that tremble at his word, 
your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified. But he shall appear to you. He shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the sea, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God. Rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All ye that love her, rejoice for her. All ye that mourn for her. Isaiah's prophecy of the day of 1948 when Israel became a nation. The nation of Israel was born in a single day. There was no war. There was no years and years and years of conquest of people having to go through and exterminate people. It was born in a single day. This is what he means when he says, before she travailed, she gave birth. These women sitting here know what it means to travail in birth. It's the pain that you have before the baby comes, isn't it? Yes. Israel had no pains before they became a nation. They were born in a single day's time. Through a written request from the UN. Yes. Brothers, these prophecies that we have heard today concern the land of Israel. The temple, the nation of Israel, they were all written thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago. Thousands of years before it happened. And it happened just the way that it was written. Of that, there could be no doubt. Of that, there could be no doubt. It's something that each and every one of us can look around us and see and know that it's true. If this much is true, what else is true? If you have to see to believe, I tell you today to believe because these are things that you can see. You're somebody that you know that has to see to believe pointing to these things. Pointing to these things. Well, there's many other things to say. But unfortunately, we can't be out here all day. There's many other things that can be said. And I'm sticking with this because of the nation of Israel because the things that we're going to go over in the next few weeks are going to be concerning these peoples. Yes. And how it is we are a part of these peoples. And how it is and why it is that we shall inherit the promises of these peoples. Yes. Next week, we're going to go over the things that are happening in this world right now. The things that are happening today. Things that were written just as many thousands of years ago that are happening today. Things that we can see on TV. Things that we can read about in the newspapers and on the internet. Things that we can see the pictures of. The things that we can watch happening right before our very eyes. If you know, if you think that you must see to believe, if you know somebody that has to see to believe, yes. Brothers, I hope you don't have to be someone who has to see to believe. Because our King Jesus Christ says, Blessed are they 
who believe and have not seen. That's what he said. That's what he said. Brothers, I hope that you can read this word and see these things as happened in the past. I know that it's true. Every word is true. Every word. Brothers, every word that I have brought down here to you is true. Every place, every piece of hope, everything has been true. say things and the way I do things and the truths that I bring so on and so forth. But I know something that they don't. I was chosen for something that they were not. Just as you see here today in front of me are chosen for the same thing that I've been chosen for. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't be sitting in front of me hearing what I have to say. Learning what I have learned to go and do what it is that I do. Tell me, guys. You'd be sitting in front of somebody else. Somebody with some other message. Somebody who experienced some other thing. But you sit here in front of me. It's just two things. That's our calling in life. Some of you sit here on stands. Some of you sit here today and felt this. Some of you know this. Some of you have been learning from this. And some of you now want this. about the things that's going to happen so that when they do, you're not afraid. That you can remain strong. That you can remain bold. That you may remain courageous. The king is in his words. Lord, we give thanks for your word, Father. We give thanks for this prophecy, Lord. Lord, it's not that we need a sign to believe by, Father, but we are thankful for prophecy, Father, that we may be prepared, thoroughly furnished, and equipped in all things, Father, that we may use it as a tool to teach other people, Father, that we may use it as a tool to bring other people to faith, Lord, to reconcile your children who are in this world whom you are seeking to your face, Father. Lord, I pray for the honor of God, Father. I pray that you equip each one of these men and women with the honor of God, the holy of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the sandals of preparation, and the sword of the Spirit, Father, that we may go forth in these times and do that for your glory, for your holy name, for your son, for your city. Yes. Give thanks for this time, Lord. We lift it up and praise to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some science and science is possible. For those of you that need it.